Thank you very much, Connie. And it's good to be here and see so many friends from years past and also to meet new people that I haven't met before. Um, I'm going to talk about a toolbox for how to develop harmonized nutrient values. Um, all of us in this audience need to play a role in putting together a toolbox, the data that is needed, the resources that are needed to, in order to implement a set of harmonized nu nutrient values. So that's the theme of my discussion. And then Lindsay will follow me, and she will give some specific examples of how this can be done. I wanted to show you this picture. This is the campus where I work, UC Berkeley. From my lab, I have a wonderful view of the Golden Gate Bridge, and you're welcome to come and see me anytime you want. I'd be glad to have you. <laughs> uh, I do not have any conflicts uh, to declare, thank goodness. So as I said, uh, I want to discuss with you a universal approach for establishing nutrient recommend values that can be implemented now. And I think we should start thinking about how we want to implement now. Uh, harmonizing the actual recommendations, as Sue explained, is going on. It is a work in progress. We haven't finished that task yet, but we certainly can begin laying the groundwork for how to implement them. So, the approaches or the procedures for establishing nutrient uh, recommended values, as I said, can be harmonized now. How to do it in your countries or your regions or even internationally. And the first step in implementing harmonized nutrient recommendations is to have a common toolbox a set of procedures, methods, and ways to go about coming up with nutrient uh, recommendations. So what are the steps for establishing a toolbox for harmonizing nutrient recommended values? First, we have to determine what components need to be in the toolbox, and then create an infrastructure for establishing and maintaining that toolbox within your own countries, your own regions, as well as internationally. And that's where I feel that IUNS can play a big role in helping make that happen. So first, let's talk about the components of a toolbox for setting nutrient recommendations. The first step in making a nutrient recommendation is to do a systematic review of what we know about that nutrient and what its functions are, the food sources of it, what the requirements are. And that's the starting point. And we also need at that time to evaluate the strength and the quality of the evidence linking the nutrient or food component with one or more nutrient or health outcomes. So it's not only looking at the nutrient per se, whether it be calcium, vitamin D, whatever, but also the health outcomes that are associated with an adequate intake of that uh, nutrient. So a systematic review of that information is the first step. Some examples might be to look at the relationship between zinc intake and linear growth in toddlers. That could be a systematic review. Or another potential systematic review might be dietary protein and body composition or muscle mass in the elderly. Both of those systematic reviews would be extremely helpful in setting recommendations for zinc intake for toddlers and protein intake for older folks. An area that we're beginning to think about and haven't done too much work on yet is how to consider chronic disease as a potential outcome associated with the nutrient intake. We've talked about this, but it's very difficult at this time to ex know exactly how to implement this review. 
but I think we need to start by doing systematic reviews on the links between chronic disease and diet. One possibility might be to look at the relationship of sodium in the diet and hypertension. Another might be to look at dietary polyunsaturated fatty acid intake and serum triglycerides. And several years ago, uh, the National Academy of Medicine did a report on chronic disease and how to evaluate it in more depth with respect to nutrient intake, which is a booklet that you might want to look at. The second aspect of the toolbox for putting together nutrient recommendations is to look at the specific or determine the specific local or regional data regarding the population. We need to know the characteristics of the population before we can set recommendations for nutrient intake. We need to look at them with respect to differences in age range among the two genders. Also, the physiological aspects on the uh, requirements, such as the usual reference body weight, height, energy intake, and what is the population health status? How much physical work is done on average, or is it a relatively sedentary population? And what are the levels of infection within the population? There are genetic differences that affect nutrient requirements, and one of them is the MTHFR gene and how it influences folate metabolism. Are there others, and do we need to consider that in making the recommendations? And then, of course, the extremes of climate and how that influences maybe sweat losses and nutrient losses that way or other ways in which nutrients are utilized. Another regional aspect or local aspect is to better understand the typical dietary pattern and characteristics. On average, what is the bioavailability of nutrients within the diet? Iron, uh, folate, B12, the usual ones that are affected by the sources of food intake. And also, what are the usual energy intakes? Are they limited? Are people subsisting on marginal intakes, or is there a tendency to have an excess of energy intake? The third aspect of the toolbox is to understand or develop the resources for the uh, development of nutrient reference values and how to evaluate them. In other words, to put together, as I'm saying, part of the toolbox would be these resources. So there would be training modules that are part of the toolbox that could be used by staff and scientists for putting together the NRVs. Also maintaining a data repository. What are the results of the national surveys, international surveys on typical nutrient intakes on the body weight and height of the individuals? And then also to maintain a comprehensive summary of the various nutrient recommended values that have been made by various countries, regions, and also internationally, such as FAO, WHO. All of that information is important when trying to put together a common set of recommendations. So that's the toolbox and the components. The next, then, is to start thinking about a group or groups that are responsible for creating and maintaining the toolbox. This I'm calling a potential toolbox coordinating center. And again, I think this is probably something should, that could be done at a country level, regional level, and of course internationally. So some possibilities for groups that could maintain the toolbox as well as make sure that it gets created appropriately would be WHO, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the International Union of Nutritional Sciences, the International Life Sciences Institute, and also regional offices, such as the Food and Nutrition Board or the European Scientific uh, Food uh, Analysis. Did I get that right? No. <laughs> um, anyway, um, most likely we would want to use more than one of these groups to put together the toolbox and to maintain uh, the coordinating center. 
So what would be the specific responsibilities of this toolbox coordinating center? Well, first is to maintain the comprehensive data repository of global, regional, and country uh, NRVs. We don't have that easily available now. You can get it, but it requires lots of time to go on the web and, and pull it all together. So having a center that assumes that responsibility will make it much easier. Also, the coordinating center should be responsible for hosting workshops for all of the partners that are involved in developing the nutrient reference values to ensure that the same system is used by all of the different groups. So this would be a great resource for various countries as they begin to undertake this responsibility. And then associated with that would be to develop and store training modules for uh, the various groups that want to implement uh, nutrient reference values and put together their own resources. And finally, uh, to develop and maintain the resources for monitoring nutritional issues within the various populations. You know, we do surveys every five years in the United States on the nutritional status of our population, but um, we don't really have a system for uh, maintaining that and for storing those data and making it readily available to others worldwide. So those are the components of the toolbox and its responsibilities. Now I want to move on and say a little bit about the process itself for establishing nutrient reference values. A common process will better assure that all nutrient reference values can be shared or revised for other populations. We don't have a common process now. We all approach it quite differently using the resources that we have available or maybe the way we've been doing it in the past. But if we could come together with a more common approach, it would enable us to exchange our data and share our data much more easily. So what are the steps, the key steps, for establishing nutrient reference values, and can we develop a common process for doing them? So the first step, I think, is to appoint a nutrient review panel for your country or your region, and to charge that panel with reviewing the data and making a decision should they revise existing reference values or establish new values? This is the key question, it's where you start. Let's say uh, we decided that we want to look to see if we should revise the zinc values for infants, that an example I used earlier. First look to see what they are, what is the new information we have, and is there a good basis for reevaluating it? Then the second step, is to appoint a specific nutrient panel that will analyze the analytical framework and the types of studies that are available and start actually putting together the numbers. And then third, that specific nutrient panel will grade and review the strength of the evidence for a specific population and for a specific nutrient as is done by the specific uh, nutrient panels. So that panel is responsible for grading and evaluating the strength of the evidence. And they do this with the systematic reviews that I was talking about earlier and the data resources, the information on the food intake and the population status. So I want to say a little bit more about the actual responsibilities for the nutrient review panel uh, at the country or regional level or global level of, for beginning this process of developing nutrient reference values. First, you need to think about, is this going to be a country panel, a regional panel, or a global panel? And many of us already have a structure in place in our respective regions or countries for developing nutrient reference values. So that part of it is uh, already in place. 
The next big major question for the panel to address is, is this going to be a comprehensive review for all of the nutrients, for all of the different population groups? We used to do that, believe it or not. Up to 1995, that was the way we did our nutrient recommendations in the US. Uh, we haven't tried to do that since and have now broken it up into the various subgroups. So if we're going to break it up into the subgroups, what are the most important characteristics of the population that need to be addressed in order to uh, consider growth needs, the physical work that they're doing, reproduction, and aging within that population? The next thing to consider is the intervention or the exposure to the nutrient of interest. What are the primary nutrient concerns? Is it an excessive intake of vitamin D due to supplementation? Or is it an inadequate intake of a micronutrient, say maybe iron? Or maybe there are other food components for which standards haven't been established in the past, such as fiber or phytate that need to be concerned. So we need to consider whether there's deficiencies, excess, and are the reliable biomarkers and indicators, and what are the nutrient-nutrient interactions. And then a the next step is to look at the comparison. Uh, what is the intervention compared with uh, in the studies that have been done? Was it an intervention where it's compared with another level of the nutrient, or was it an intervention where it was a lack of the nutrient per se? All of those data have to be considered in putting the process together. And finally, what was the outcome of the nutrient of concern? Did it improve the nutritional status or overall health? Was that the major um, outcome considered? Or was it a prevention of chronic disease? So that's the work of the nutrient panel then they are the ones that would appoint a specific nutrient review panel for coming up with the actual numbers. And as I said, the first step is usually to conduct or request a systematic review. In the US, in the last couple years when we've been involved with this uh, effort uh, using uh, ranking recommendations for calcium and vitamin D, the government did the systematic review for us for vitamin D. So the committee did not have to do that. And that was very helpful, uh, took a big workload off of the committee, and it gave the committee a good place to start for doing their work. Then when the committee begins its process, it basically can consider going in two directions with respect to the nutrient and its recommendation. Maybe they feel that the nutrient reference value that currently is okay, that they're going to keep it, but it needs to be updated. And then they go and evaluate the usual intakes and diets of the population and determine how it uh, compares with the nutrient reference value and makes adjustments also for any local conditions that may need to be considered, such as physical activity or temperature or uh, other climatic uh, conditions. Then another possibility where they feel that there is not a nutrient reference value that can be updated, there would be a need to establish a new nutrient reference value. And then it requires first to divide, define the approach and appraise the evidence that is available for making this new uh, NRV. This might be something that might be done for uh, uh, fluoride, for example. And then evaluate the usual intakes and the patterns of the population to see if they are consistent with what looks like the uh, NRV is going to be. Finally, the nutrient review panel will either accept existing values or revise them or derive a new nutrient reference value. So let me just give you an example of how my, one might go through this process for developing a nutrient reference value for infant zinc intake. Basically, as I see it, there are four key steps 
First, to commission the systematic review I was talking about uh, regarding the nutrient requirements of uh, breastfed or non-breastfed infants. As you can tell, I'm suggesting that you try to get your government support to do the systematic review for you because it is a big job and it takes a lot of responsibility uh, off of the actual committees. So uh, government employees can do the systematic review and it's been our experience in the states to approach it that way. But then also to grade the evidence, the quality of the evidence, the adequacy of the evidence, and determine how strong it is. And then finally uh, appoint a specific nutrient review panel who would take that evidence and put it together and come up with some new nutrient reference values. You see, I'm suggesting that we don't take all of the 20 or so required nutrients for all of the different population groups and do it all at one time. That would be completely overwhelming. I think we moved into an era where we need to break it down and address specific nutrients for specific population groups in order to get this uh, accomplished in a reasonable way. So, in summary, I'd like us to kind of step back from these specific steps and processes for developing uh, nutrient reference values and think about some of the bigger issues that I think we need to address. And I think it's something that all of you in this room can help bring about. I think we need to consider putting together a standing committee that is responsible for developing the analytical frameworks and protocols for deriving nutrient reference values within a country, region, or internationally. And I don't think if you're from Switzerland that you should wait until the European Union has come up. I think go ahead and put together your own values and then eventually they can be all rolled together in something that's appropriate for the region and internationally. Second, we need to establish an infrastructure for obtaining, storing, and assessing nutrient issues and, and recommendations for a population. We don't really have that in place now. And without that infrastructure, it makes it really hard to pull together all of the data needed in a reasonable period of time to come up with well-formatted nutrient reference values. So we need to build on the ongoing nutritional assessments that are being done at the country uh, level or regional level. And this is a, a process that's, that is going to require quite a few resources and all of us need to contribute to making it happen. Industry, governments, as well as scientific uh, organizations. And finally, I've talked about the toolbox and the resources needed in the toolbox and how to train people and bring about uh, an update in the development of nutrient reference values. I feel that we need an international group that takes on responsibility for maintaining the resources and facilitating the nutrient reference values and associated dietary guidelines. We do not have that now. It's very fragmented. And I think it would be a much easier pro process and a much more effective process if we had an international group who helped coordinate all of this effort. So I thank you for your attention and would be glad to uh, listen to any comments or thoughts you have and also uh, take a question or two. Thank you very much.